nice to be here and to, and to go over God's word to, together. We're going to be back in class. We're going to be looking at the spring of life. Before we dive too far, too far in, let's, let's go ahead and give a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we come to you so thankful that you've given us this day, thankful that you've given us time to be together and time to study your word, Lord. Thank you for your love and the love that we have for each other. Thank you that we have each other to encourage one another and to grow. Thank you for the common love that we have together. Thank you for the Savior that saved us. And since his name we pray, amen. Amen. So we're looking at the spring of life. You want to turn your Bibles open, open to Jeremiah 1. And Jeremiah 1, keep a marker there and then turn to Proverbs 3. Jeremiah 1, marker there, Proverbs 3. Last time we had a great discussion on paths, what it meant to accept God's path for us, especially in the spring of life. Sunday, we introduced Jeremiah, if you guys remember, just for a split second. But we're going to dive a little deeper into the person of Jeremiah and see if we can't glean something from his youth and spiritual journey. I have really appreciated all of your guys' comments and thoughts and opinions. It's been really great to listen to them all. It's been really helpful. And I think it it has really enriched the, the class and, and the class material. I've been taking notes of some of the things you've been saying so that when Caleb and Ethan and I are in the next class in August teaching them, I can, we can share some of you guys' wisdom with them. So I really want to, I really appreciate you guys. I'm very thankful for it. And when I think of you guys' comments and, and thoughts, I think of Proverbs 3. If you're in Proverbs 3, look at Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. It says, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who hold to her. Those who hold, hold her fast are called blessed. And that's what it's all about, getting a deeper understanding of God's wisdom and sharing that wisdom so that our ways are more pleasant and peaceful, as it says there in verse 17. And so far, we've talked, we went over a lot. We went over the wisdom books. We talked about what it's like to have an identity and and purpose in Christ and the youth and the spring of our life. We saw Joseph as Ethan gave some some great classes in the spring of his life, and we, we got something from that. And then Sunday, we looked at God's past as well. I want to hear from you guys. What is something unique that you've learned so far in this class, kind of reaching the halfway point, a little, a little further than that, but the halfway point? What's something you guys have, have learned? Gonna call on Brock here soon. <laughs> Give me a Devo. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. You take those experiences that you've learned and everything with you into the next, and it builds on top of one another instead of just moving on. Go ahead. (laughs) It's, yeah. Absolutely. And we're going to look at how that affects the generations, too. That's a great point. Just because we're older doesn't necessarily mean we're wise. Any other thoughts? Hmm. Uh, 
That's a good point. Uh, I like that. It's launching yourself in the other seasons, and some of those seasons even have its own foundation period. Really good thoughts. Really good thoughts. All right, if you're in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1. We talked Sunday, we introduced him, we looked at verses 4 and 5, if you guys remember. Jeremiah is a pretty unique character in a lot of ways. But I don't know about you guys, but I feel like sometimes he's overlooked, he's overshadowed by Isaiah uh, many times. Jeremiah, however, is pretty unique because he's young when God calls him to start his ministry and his prophecies here to the people of Judah. It's believed that he was even in his teens, maybe younger teens, but probably around the age of 17. And as mentioned Sunday, he starts his ministry during the reign of King Josiah. King Josiah becomes king around the age of eight. So there's some youthfulness here. Look at Jeremiah 1 verse 2. It says, The Lord's message came to him in the 13th year that Josiah, son of Ammon, ruled over Judah. King Josiah, if you remember, is also considered a good king. He's one of the good kings of Judah. And King Josiah, he, he knows of God, and he's already started this, this reform, if you will, in the temple and with God's people. But Jeremiah is going to see not just this good king, he's going to see other evil kings as well, and eventually the captivity of God's people from Babylon. And I'm giving this backstory because it shines light on the context that we perceive from this, from, this, from this man here, Jeremiah, when we read God's word. So start with me in Jeremiah 1, and read with me Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So we read that text. What are you guys seeing in this text? What do you guys see from this from these verses he uses young people as well as old people all ages he uses them that's a really good point mm -hmm. he's with them you can do what I'm telling you to do you can I'm with you you can have the courage to move forward absolutely what are your thoughts Confidence. confidence. Yeah, it seems like maybe Jeremiah isn't as confident, so God's instilling, hey, have some confidence. Have some confidence. Really good point. Confidence is going to be useful, too, because his ministry is going to be a tough one. He doesn't have a happy message. What are their thoughts? That's a good point. He's telling me the spring of your life, you better start now to rely on me. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. 
Ja. It's pretty special. Especially for Jeremiah and his situation. It's really special. Absolutely. And we kind of glance over that little part, don't we, sometimes? Your thoughts? Go ahead, Justin. I mean, I see here in this text, honestly, a little bit of similarity. Mm. I guess what stands out to me is Moses takes why he took Dakota too. Right. And you see this great thing of him raising the play of Levi. So it makes me think that the clarity is here. When God calls him to play with the great thing, he's going to pass it up to the Not yet. No matter what age it is. Yeah, just because it looks difficult doesn't mean it's not a big responsibility, but it's an honor as well to be a servant of God's. Any other thoughts? Really good point. This is kind of similar, if you think of, to Moses, to Gideon, both of whom used excuses to get out of doing what God wanted them to be doing. I find it interesting in verse 6 that Jeremiah uses the excuse not to be able to speak well because he is what? Because he's young. You look at society today and skill is often associated with age. And that is true to some extent, if you think about it. The longer we have time to work on something, the longer we have time to master our craft, that means often that we'll be better at that thing. But for the youth, that idea, those people can be intimidating sometimes. We talked about some disadvantages in the spring of life. Lack of experience, immaturity, some of those things. We went on and on. If we think about Timothy, for example, this is pretty similar to how Timothy may have felt. We don't know exactly how Timothy felt, but if you read in 1 Timothy 4.12, when Paul tells Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, we can kind of see that concern there. It goes on, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. When we look at verse 6 of Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah says what? I do not know how to speak. Well, obviously that's not true. He's speaking right there in the text. It's not that he doesn't know how to speak. It's that he doesn't really know how to speak well. And when we read that, we can see some underlying tones there, some concerns, if you will, like, why don't you pick someone who's older, someone who can speak more eloquently? Why don't you pick someone who is older so, because they won't take me seriously? I'm too young. They won't take me seriously. But there's even a deeper level there that we hear, a deeper concern. How do I relate to the older generation? How do I relate to the older generation? You have to remember, King Josiah is, is about 20 years old at this time. And like I mentioned before, he's, he knows God. He started reform. He's knocked all the, the idols out of Judah at this time. And so the people that are causing the trouble, and this is in, sorry, this is in 2 Chronicles 34 and, 1 King, and 2 Kings 23-24 for your notes, But the ungodly people causing a lot of trouble at this time isn't necessarily the younger generation. While they they may have some problems, they may be a problem, it's definitely, it seems to be the old generation that has introduced these false gods and these types of worship way before Josiah or Jeremiah came onto the scene here. A part of Jeremiah's job, we don't think about this often, is to reach out and to prophesy to the older people of Judah. If you think about us today, you know, we have people living together for a much longer time, which means we have generations existing, more generations existing at the same time. And then you add on top of that technology and innovation, and what seems to be happening is this gap, this distance between generations goes further and further and further. You have differences. 
So with that in mind, a question I kind of have for you guys, I want to kind of discuss this. How do we bridge the gap or disconnect between generations? Absolutely. It, there does have to be a love and respect. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to do. It has to be built and learned, and there may, may be mistakes made. Absolutely. But that's how often respect is gained, is through mistakes. So maybe the young people needs, need to maybe, you know, lower their pride a little bit, be more accepting of the older people's wisdom and to learn from that. I like that. I like that. Exactly. There's, so there's a mutual shareness there and accepting. Go ahead. We have to be accepting of each other. That's really good. Accepting of, of the generation's differences and how they go about it. Especially when we're working together in the same kingdom. You know, each generation is going to relate to their own differently. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Go for it. Mm hmm. You're absolutely right. There should be truth there. I, I like where you're going. Mm. Mm. Okay, mentorship. I, I like that. Being able to mentor the younger generation. Uh, I, like, I like what we're seeing here. We're seeing, you know, being able to uh, accept the differences with an underlying understanding. Is those differences based in biblical principles? Being able to mentorship, being open to ideas and accepting. What else? Go for it. To develop a relationship. Don't let stereotypes get in your way. Okay. Really good. No, that's really good. Sometimes stereotypes do get in the way. Go for it. Hmm. No. So we don't know each other. There we go. Case in point. <laughs> I need to know who that was. Dorothy Cates. Okay, I'm writing that down. That's really good. <laughs> so at this point, whose responsibility is that? That's. Is that the young person? And I say it. I was going to say. That's right. If I as a 
medium older person. Mm -hmm. Wait for the younger people to come. Young in. person, right, right. Yes. Well, thanks. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. And that what comes down to is building relationships. If we can build relationships and get out of our comfort zone, that we can share with one another, not just wisdom, but experiences and knowledge that can grow a deeper connection of really respecting one another. Because Mary Jane was reading my notes. That's the first thing I got, is love and respect should be real key when bridging that gap. Very few problems between people are solved without some sort of respect. We see conflict with wars, and when they finally go to sign that peace treaty, they're signing that peace treaty because there's a certain level of respect. Often, when conflict happens, it's because that person has lost respect with them or with that other side. And when people lose respect, well, now they're more willing to do things that they were not willing to do before. Sometimes evil things, often disrespectful things. And so, if we look at the gap and the differences between the seasons of life, we have to respect one another. The younger should be respecting people, for, you know, respecting the older, for the life lived, for the legacy of faith left and that impression left. But it should go hand in hand, like you guys were talking about. It should be both. There should be a level of respect mutually, and the older should respect, sorry, the, the older should respect the younger for the effort that they, they're putting in. Yeah. I think you could add, um, try and maybe understanding this, or maybe trying to understand. Um, I remember when I was a young teenager, and I was kind of looking at older parents, I was good, and now I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. They're reading their Bible on their phone. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. <laughs> That's really good. So there's an understanding there. Yeah, building that understanding. Really good. Any other thoughts before I continue? The first one I saw was, you know, love and respect, but you guys all gave great points. Go for it. Yeah. me think because you're absolutely right there should definitely be a level of humility to be able to do that as well i didn't think about that but that's really good mm, bring your children with you oh yeah i know that for sure i know that for sure i think it's also it's going to take time so patience mm. you can't get frustrated and think well I reached out, they, they're not understanding me, they're not hearing me, or I don't get them, I don't understand them, I think there's something. Yeah. Sometimes a generation is so disconnected, it's like learning a whole new language, and there does need to be some patience there. Let's look at Jeremiah 7. Turn with me to Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah here is standing in the temple gates here. He's talking to the people of Judah. Look at verses 5 through 7. Jeremiah 7, verses 5 through 7. 
if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Look at verse 5. It says, you truly executed justice one with another. How often is that the case between generations and the generation gap? How often do we treat one another fairly and, you know, each other and their give each other the proper attention that they deserve according to their generation? How often do we have a tendency to treat the other generation, older or younger, as foreigners or invaders? The older will say to the younger, you know, you're just, you're just coming on too strong, you're taking over. And the younger will say to the older, you're, just, you're holding us back, and we see this conflict all the time. How do we stop treating one another as foreigners and start treating each other fairly with love and respect? Well, we need to start respecting one another. No matter the season of life that we find ourselves in, because we work together, we work together for his kingdom. We'll turn over to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, look at verse 32. The principle that's expressed here is important for us to practice if we want to see the distance between these two gener- between generations narrow, if you will. Leviticus 19:32. It says, "You must stand up in the presence of the aged, honor the presence of an elder, and fear your God. I am the Lord. Notice the next verse talks about foreigners. Verse 33, when a resident foreigner lives with you in your land, you must not oppress him. Our elders are not foreigners, and we can make that mistake sometimes. They are valuable to us and necessary, necessary for our success. And the sooner we realize that as the people in the spring of their life, we will be better to glorify God as we work together. Any other thoughts? Hmm. That's really good. That was really good. We need to talk about, and that kind of leads into the next thing I had here. And Macy brought it up as well. We need Jesus. We need truth if we're going to build that gap. That seems to be a second thing that I'm seeing. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Turn with me to Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3, as believers, we know that Jesus is the truth and the way. Jeremiah 3, though, one of the underlying messages here that in Jer's ministry is to remind the people of Judah here and the people of Israel that they've turned away from God. We need to turn the right way. We need to go the right direction. We need to go back to God, turn back to God. And he expresses how we need to repent in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3. God's people need to repent. I want you to pay attention here to the way Jeremiah is urging these people to walk and the truth he is proclaiming, starting in verse 12. It says, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am a merciful, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when, and when you have multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. 
At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall gather to it to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they shall no more stub they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel, and together they shall come from the land of the north and the land that I gave your fathers for a heritage. And look at the plea in verse 19 from God. I said, how I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations, and I thought you would call me my father, and would not turn from following me. Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, you have, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Jeremiah wants God's people to realize, as he talks to Israel in this passage and later through Judah, that they are not meant to be divided. Notice the words there in this passage, in this text. Look at verse 14. I am your master. Look at verse 15. One from a city and two from a family. Verse 18, Judah shall join the house of Israel and together they shall come from the land that I gave your fathers for a heritage. Whether old or young, God's people are meant to work together. No matter the season of life, they're, be they're meant to be a family. God's people, no matter the generation, serve one master Turn with me to John 14. John 14, look at verses 5 through 7. John 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, comes to the Father, except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So no matter the season of life that we are in, we have to ask ourselves, are we working together to follow Jesus, who is the way? Are we working together to stand for Jesus, who is truth? Are we working together to live for Jesus, our Savior, who gives purpose to our life? If we're working together, then we can move as one body for his kingdom, and we can glorify him. We can bridge that gap we see between the generations. Any thoughts and comments? Yes, yes, sir. Mm. Absolutely. Amen. He's the unifying factor. Absolutely. Very good. Absolutely. That's a really good comment. Any other thoughts? Turn to Romans 12 as we close. Romans 12. Look at verses 9 through 18. I think this is a beautiful passage. And many, of you, many of you know it. But it really sums up kind of what we're talking about here. As we act and live together. Starting with verse 9. Romans 12 verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This passage, like I said, really sums up beautifully how the generations should bridge the gap and work together harmoniously for the good of God's kingdom because we truly are working together as one body. Another version in verse 11 might say, never be lacking in zeal and keep your spiritual fervor. Meaning that our enthusiasm and passion should not be you know, fizzled out. So regardless of what stage we are in, the spring of life, that zeal, that fervor, oftentimes it's at an all-time high for many. We want to make sure that doesn't get squashed. We want to make sure that stays on throughout the seasons. And often that comes with learning from other generations as we grow closer to Jesus together. I only have a few more minutes, but that kind of leads into my last question as we close. We can discuss this before we close. How do we encourage those who are in the spring of life so that they can continue to grow? By example. Very good. By example. How else? Right there, yeah. Good point. So feeding on learning and desiring to feed off is one way that really encourages younger and me. That's really good. Feeding off one another. Feeding off one another. Really good. Thank you guys for your thoughts and your comments. And that's class. Thank you guys.